Welcome, Dr. Underhill. Thank you for being here. Oh, my pleasure. I'm Bob Crawford. I'm Ben Sawyer. This is the road to now. It is. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, you may have noticed that this road we've been on recently has had flashing signs warning us of the FBI, or at least on certain sides of the road. And so Bob and I were talking recently about you know, episodes that, that engage with topics that are in the, in the news. And we came up with one that I don't know how we didn't get to do this before. We didn't think to do this before, but now it's perfect. Bob, you want to introduce the episode and our guest today? Uh, yes. Um, our, our guest is Dr. Stephen Underhill from Marshall University. And he is an expert in the history of the FBI and particularly the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover. He's written a few really, uh, pretty eye-opening uh, papers about um, Director Hoover. But Stephen, can, can we can we start at the beginning? I know we we don't want we want to talk about today. We don't want to waste all our time, but you know, it is the road to now. And I was doing a little reading of the history of the FBI the other day and it started under Theodore Roosevelt. So can you maybe just take us to the beginning of, of the FBI? Absolutely. Uh, so the beginning of the FBI is that uh, in about 1908, Theodore Roosevelt needed investigators. And before this point, the president, when meeting investigators, would lean on the Secret Service. Uh, and so he decided it was time to actually get some full-time investigators. And so he built a bureau and he put that in the Department of Justice. Uh, and the Department of Justice at this point would have been about... Uh, 55 years old, it, it gets invented in the 1970s, or sorry, the 1870s, uh, in, in response to the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and the need to have people, um, so the DOJ is in response to the Ku Klux Klan for the sake of going after radicals, and they needed a federal government agency that could go after radicals. And then uh, by 1908 or so, Theodore Roosevelt decided that we needed a Bureau of Investigation. And if you're going after radicals, that helps. Uh, but Roosevelt, at that point, he had his vision on Congress, uh, and he was worried about corruption in Congress. Um, and Congress did obviously did not welcome the addition of investigators to the DOJ because they thought it would be used against them. And this early tension is worth thinking about because, um, you know, we can, I'm just going to fast forward and say how this plays out. Uh, FBI directors over the year, though the FBI was created to investigate white collar crime, uh, has decided to not investigate members of Congress because uh, the pushback Congress has created. Uh, in particular, if you're an FBI director and you cross Congress, you have to worry about your appropriations. You have to worry about your jurisdictions getting snipped. Um, and so this tension that happens at the very beginning uh, is worth thinking about because it will mold the history and the trajectory of the agency uh, because you have uh, high power people not wanting to be investigated. At the same time, you need their consent to have that agency. And so this history uh, follows us through like the 1910s and in the 1910s, the Mann Act, uh, which was about white slavery, which is another just racism. It was going after interracial relationships uh, is, is the thing that brings the FBI, well, the Bureau of Investigation money at that point, and by money, I also mean power and jurisdiction. Uh, then with World War I came the development of the radical unit, and this is when J. Edgar Hoover first gets hired in around 1917 uh, by the DOJ. And then in time, he gets moved into uh, the Bureau of Investigation where he is front and center for the Pomerades. Uh, and then the Teapot Dome scandal happens a few years that run 1923, 1924, uh, and both the Palmer Raids and the Teapot Dome scandal embarrass the DOJ. And so it causes kind of like a, like a retraction moment where suddenly like, the powers over the Bureau of Investigation kind of begin to like squeeze it in a little bit because there's, there's fears that it's kind of just an, an abusive organization. And somehow though J. Edgar Hoover was involved in the radical unit under A. Mitchell Palmer, I think the story is he had a friend uh, who was working kind of like a, like, a, like I, I, if I remember this right, it's like it's a friend who's like a friend of his mom's who's working as a secretary and happens to know the attorney general who's and the attorney general's job is to start reforming the DOJ and the Bureau of Investigation. And she kind of just 
slips in a good word. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, we understand that there's been problems, but not you, not you, Edgar. Like, no, nah. like he, he just happened to work there. You know, he wasn't responsible for it. And the attorney general, uh, and this guy is Harlan Fisk Stone, and he would go on to become a Supreme Court justice. And he would say the biggest mistake of his entire life was this moment right here that in 1925, he says, all right, J. Edgar Hoover, welcome aboard. You are now the Bureau of Investigation Director. Uh, and hey, I'm going to trust you to make this a clean organization. And so, so can we job. can we just can we just take a break yeah. right there because there's yeah. so much already, and yeah. already I feel this tension with this organization, right? right. They come about uh, the Department of Justice. If we take it back to that, they're there to fight the K to take down the KKK, and you would and look at where we are today right let's well, i guess we're not going to we're not going to go chrono, we're going to go back and forth today i imagine in this conversation oh, yeah. let's do that and what what are the kkk well if you ask me and i'm a bass player i wouldn't take my opinion on <laughs> on many things uh bass is important it is but but i mean you know we're not, i was just in nashville where you can't throw a rock without hitting a bass player you know so anyway but former bass but, player here but I would I would say uh, domestic KKK that's a domestic terrorist organization, and so I would agree. immediately if I was um you know cuckoo for cocoa puffs conspiracy theorist <laughs> I would say mm, this is the deep state here we go here we go right off the bat deep yeah. state right yeah there. this this is it Bob it's like this is what I'm thinking this whole time is that it's fascinating because all of this is the story of like the tension between the federal federal government and the state governments right this tension because the fbi what you're saying in all of this whether you're you're after the kkk during you know during in the 1870s whether you're after anarchists you know during the you know in the early years uh all these people are are, are their target groups but this is a this is an executive office and this is what i want to break down for for a lot of people who listen the fbi works with the executive and so there's a balance of powers between Congress and the executive. And it seems to me like as fear of a powerful executive grows or acceptance of a powerful uh, executive grows, so goes the reputation of the FBI. Is, it, is this fair? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. As in the, the executive, as in like the, the president, the Oval Office, its power will expand with the FBI. Um, and so and what we see is, I mean, we could just jump to the New Deal because this is exactly what happens. Uh, so uh, it's 1933, FDR is stumping on, hey, there's like, you know, give me the power of like a, a general to fight a war. You know, this is going to be a war on poverty. Uh, I need your support. And, you know, and, he, and this is his first inaugural. And he's giving this speech and he's using these words because he's saying, hey, I get that there's going to be a bunch of obstructionists. There's going to be a bunch of Republicans who are going to push back. But he's saying, hey, voters, you know, back, get behind me. And let's uh, let's push forward and create a new expanded executive. And now here's there's a number of moments in history where Hoover just gets off the hook. So FDR's first attorney general, who like he on the campaign trail, he names uh, that guy hates Hoover. And that guy says, man, I'm going to fire Hoover first day of office. Well, that guy's on a train going to the inauguration and he dies. And so that guy disappears. And then instead we get Homer Still Cummings. And Homer Still Cummings, uh, he's this guy, like he comes in, I don't think he's a bad guy. I think he's a guy who, it's early 1930s and he gets that mass media has changed power. Meaning because of mass media, messages can circulate. Uh, and with the circulation of messages, you can control image in new ways, right? Public relations is a new, new business. Um, and Cummings hears FDR's like war rhetoric and he announces a war on crime. And he also then, and, and so, and so, but you know, and he was gonna take that, that kind of link. If we're gonna have a war on crime, we're gonna go after the John Dillinger's, we're gonna go after the Babyface Nelson's. And the fact that I can say these names and you know who I mean, illustrates how powerful these names were, right? We talked about Bonnie and Clyde, it goes on, Machine Gun Kelly. Uh, but what Hoover does at the same moment in 1933, and here is what I believe does this interaction of expanding both the FBI office or you know, the FBI as an agency, the FBI director as a 
job and also the president as like the imperial presidency that then takes over Congress. It's this moment right here. Uh, Hoover at this point, this early realizes that if he can control his media, he can control his, I mean, he can just control power. And at the same time, Joseph Stalin and Benito Mussolini are getting to the same conclusion. And I'm not, I don't want to say a one for one comparison here, but these are all dudes, depression era. Uh, they're coming out of World War I, where America just masterfully played the Committee for Public Information. Uh, so Edward Bernays and Walter Lippmann are writing their scholarship about how propaganda works in the new media. And so what Hoover does is does this. This is pretty, pretty genius, pretty sneaky. So because he's the FBI director, he has uh, field agents and field offices across the country. And he says, all right, hey, special agents in charge, right? That's called a SAC. Hey, SAC, uh, your primary job, you are to go to the local media outlets of all the places in your area. And you are to go there and you are to schmooze and you are going to make this deal. If you want a good relationship with the FBI, and therefore you want FBI files that you can then use to write your news stories, write your movies, write your radio scripts, you know, on and on and on and on and on. You give us good press coverage. You let us even control that press coverage. You let us even write our own press coverage and we hand it to you and you're gonna pretend it's yours. You do that and we'll give you access to FBI files. If you don't, don't ever call us for any favors. And if you talk about this or you try to embarrass us, well, you're on our list, right? And we will, we will, we'll, we'll make short, you know, short shift of you. It's an offer uh, you can't refuse, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, I mean, it's money on one side versus pain on the other. When I think about this time period, you're talking about the early 30s, I think of the G-Men and James Cagney. And, yeah. you know, you, you mentioned all these famous cases with Dillinger and Bonnie and Clyde. and who was who was uh uh you know telling us about this this was the, these fbi agents were glorified in motion pictures yep. on the big screen and this is like the beginning of hollywood and um marty mentioned james cagney and so we know that ben and i and all three of us know this probably from bugs bunny cartoons <laughs> and bugs bunny imitating james cagney and Edward G. Robinson, right? Edward G. Robinson. Mm -hmm. rah, rah. So, <laughs> so to, to talk about that. What what that Hollywood did for the FBI at that period? Okay, so it is mid nineteen thirties. Uh, you have conservatives still not that happy with Roosevelt, but you also have Roosevelt hitching his wagon to J. Edgar Hoover because J. Edgar Hoover makes himself a celebrity, and Roosevelt says, "What you like kidnappers?" Huh, Republicans? That's why you're against the New Deal? Uh, what, you like, you know, you know, you, you fill in the blank of like the, the villain, you like the gangsters? You know, that's why uh, you're against my administration? And so Roosevelt ties himself and ties the New Deal to Hoover. And why that happens is because what you're talking about here where Hoover makes himself a celebrity. And so he goes to Hollywood and, and yeah, like he, it becomes, so in 1935, he starts what's called the Crime Records Division. And the Crime Records Division is, uh, it's a part of the FBI, and it was based on an appropriation to, to start um, collecting statistics about crime and then to also publish information about crime. So he uses that money and this idea that we're doing crime st uh, statistics and we're doing crime records to create his propaganda mill. And what the propaganda mill does is so you have that, that Los Angeles field office, and it goes into Hollywood, and it goes deep. And it says, uh, hey, we're going to help you because you're in a bind right now. And your bind is this. The parents and churches and all, you know, all the, all, all the people who are morally decent, they're very mad at Hollywood. They're mad at Hollywood because they're uh, angry with the gangster genre, which has supplanted the um, Western genre as the most popular film cycle in this moment, right? So, so those, those gangster movies. Uh, people are mad because in these films, uh, they glorify the bad guy or they illustrate the collapse of American life during the Great Depression. And so people are like, hey, this is terrible and there's no rating system. And so they create the Hayes Code and the Hayes Code says, all right, hey, uh, we either want self-censorship or we want, um, 
we're gonna we're gonna come in and we're gonna start like putting ratings on and we're gonna make it clear which which films are suitable for children and which films aren't and so hollywood's worried hollywood's worried that this thing is about to hurt and so j edgar hoover goes to hollywood and he says hey guys why don't we just flip the script and instead of making these gangster films we'll make the g-man films uh, and I will give you all my FBI files and you can base your movies off the FBI files. You can shoot your movies inside the FBI. You can use our stuff. I'll give you FBI agents and they will teach you how to look like the FBI. I'll give you our, I'll give you our stuff and you can use our stuff as props. And maybe, just maybe, you could put in a nice word or two about the FBI director, which they do. And so they, they'll like a few of these movies will mention the FBI director. Uh, sometimes movies will even show like stock footage of Hoover. And so he puts himself into the movies, literally. And so when I say he made himself a celebrity, like I mean it, like, like movie going audiences get bedazzled by this guy who seems larger than life. Um, and, and that's a huge asset to FDR because now FDR can say, I'm with this guy. Yeah, and FDR, it seems like this is like a sec, like a, a, I never thought about this before, but like during the depression, you're having to, you're dealing with coming out of like this area, this era of like the, the so-called do nothing presidents, you know, it's just kind of a, excessive, but like a, a country that after world war one, the Pomerades and everything wanted nothing to do with the federal government. And so now FDR has this mandate, but he has to legitimize it. So it, it seems to me like what Hoover is doing here is playing a brilliant role of le legitimizing an executive office. And so do you think this is part of the, does he play a role in FDR's success in actually like justifying federal intervention? Oh, absolutely. Because uh, FDR has a few, at the beginning of the Great Depression, he has his struggles with conservatives and Hoover takes out his opposition. And uh, because Hoover, I mean, he does this, he goes, hey, so if you're like anti-FBI, that means you're saying pro-gangster, you're saying you're pro-kidnapper, and this is right after the Lindbergh Law and the Lindbergh Baby. Right. And so he he smears the conservatives like he is like the bulldog for FDR. Uh, States, this is how you yeah. get someone like a Hitler or something where they're like, yeah. hey, he's out of control, but he's really he's working good for us. I'm sure at some point we'll keep him in check. Like this seemed to me seems to me like to open up some timelines that are really dark. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and the problem is Hoover totally screws FDR like FDR works until FDR dies. Uh, because FDR dies in office and Harry Truman is no FDR. Um, and Truman, Hoover is able to just mow him down. And this is why you get the Red Scare right after FDR dies, because now there is no check. And now, right. now the New Deal is the enemy. So let's talk about the Red Scare. And because the FBI, when the atomic, with the Atomic Energy Act, the FBI is tasked with protecting nuclear secrets. Oh, wait. 2022 the fbi is tasked with protecting nuclear secrets where have i heard that lately yep so talk about that like like them coming into that truman era that that red scare era all right and i'll set it up so uh spoiler there'll be some foreshadowing <laughs> so, so it's uh 1946, uh, it's, it's Truman's in office. And just actually, so Truman takes off, let's do this. April 45, FDR dies, Truman takes office. May 1945, it begins circulating that Truman wants Hoover gone. Uh, and, and heads up everybody, True, Hoover stays in office till he dies in 1972. So, so Hoover wins this. Um, by January, it seems as though, January of 1946, it seems as though uh, Truman has his successor. And it's a guy that's going to be coming out of the Bureau of the Budget. And rumors start circulating around D.C. that this is about to happen and um, Hoover's about to get fired. Well, it's at this moment where suddenly J. Edgar Hoover suddenly has this strong, strong feeling that the New Deal is uh, filled with, with Soviet spies and communists, and that any attempt to move him from office is obviously an attempt from Moscow. And what, looking back, you might be like, okay, well, yeah, we were fighting Moscow, but not at that point, we weren't fighting Moscow. This is before things go bad with Moscow. And I'm not saying that he like, because of him, uh, you know, the red, you know, he caused, you know, the Cold War, but I'm saying is he definitely pushed us into a panic about how, how close we were to combat with uh, the Soviet Union, because he says that the 
Essentially, the New Deal, the NAACP, the civil rights movement, organized labor, all these people are Soviet guerrillas ready uh, for an insurrection. And so it's in this context that also you get the spy scare. And the spy scare does happen. The, the spy scare is real. There are New Dealers uh, giving nuclear secrets to the Soviet Union. The most famous case is also obviously going to be the Rosenbergs because it leads to their execution in 1953. Uh, and Hoover ties these two things together. There are spies, you know that, because the these guys have gone to court. The judges have had the cases. Uh, so be afraid of you know, those nuclear spies, but also be super afraid because all these, all these liberals are dangerous fanatics who are trying to essentially betray America and give us over to the Soviet Union. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And why this is like why this is like so interesting to me as a as a historian as a rhetorician. When this happens, he I mean Hoover just like collapses the credibility of the New Deal, and people who were once proud New Dealers leave in droves and they join the Republican Party. Uh, like the and the New Deal coalition just kind of collapses, and this leads us into the rise of people like uh, Richard Nixon. Um, Right, Eisenhower. It should be mentioned that Hoover's working with Richard Nixon in Congress at this point, and Hoover's also secretly working with Ronald Reagan at this point because Reagan's in Hollywood in charge of the uh, Screenwriters Guild, and Gerald Ford is in the background. So a bunch of future presidents are hanging out. Republican presidents are hanging out with J. Edgar Hoover at this moment in the late forties. Um, and and with this moment, like, like, like let's do a brain exercise, right? So if you imagine the New Deal as an era. Right, and you imagine the Cold War as an era, and you recognize that these things happen right next to each other. Is that weird that there is no gradual? It's just like, boom, one stops and the other starts. Like, what do you think about? Like, it, I, I do this with my students. Like, 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 why? Why do you think history is remembered like that? Well, it's it seems like from talking to you, it was a manipulation of the of the public media of the public narrative right the public perspectives and and also the idea of of the need of an enemy there needs to be an enemy right we we we, we defeat the nazis and the fascists in world war ii and we come back home and and uh, there needs to be someone to fight to to kind of rally an american uh narrative ben yeah i mean and like what strikes me here is like how interestingly like you go from the new deal which is all about really all about domestic politics i mean you've got like the fair neighbor policy and things like that then you go into world war ii which shifts the focus abroad and it seems like what truman's or what hoover's able to do is keep that focus abroad and when i'm thinking about this collectively you know i've always just th thought like what a blunder it was to appoint truman as his as his vice president that last term you know, and I, I've always thought about that in terms of foreign policy, because, you know, because because Truman has no foreign policy experience, right? He's a senator from Missouri. And now this strikes me that, like, when you know, if you're FDR, that that this guy, J. Edgar Hoover, has built a cult of personality around himself and not only has power inside the executive office, which this tension within the executive is fascinating because ostensibly the president's this guy's boss, right? That tension's fascinating. But the idea of putting like a, 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 an unseasoned, fairly unseasoned guy in the executive when you know he's going to be up against a guy who's been there for, you know, over a decade at this point, that to me just seems like an extra, an extra fumble. So like, is there, is there no concept that FDR has that putting Truman in there could lead to these problems? I don't think, I mean, obviously FDR doesn't plan on dying, right? And I think because he does die, it's like this sad, just hiccup of history that allows this dark timeline. But that said, I mean, Hoover was so entrenched by the end of World War II anyway. Uh, so who knows what Hoover would have done to any next president, you know, whether it be Truman, whether it be like if Truman lost and a Republican was elected. Um, but there was no checking Hoover's power at this point because he had uh, just immense. So it, it works like this. So you got that media side where he can control media. Now, the other side is because of World War II, um, Momentum develops for the FBI to figure out how to neutralize its enemies. And by the way, I think we'll be talking about how the FBI's enemies today. Watch this. Um, 
so it's about 1939 or so. Well, actually, it, it's beginning in the mid-30s. Uh, FDR starts leaning on Hoover, saying, hey, look, I want to get into this war. However, I know that this country is mainly isolationist between liberals and Democrats, or liberals and Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, Democrats, Republicans. Uh, can you verify these people are loyal? Or are these people uh, you know, just sympathetic to like our, our enemies? And Hoover comes back and he says, actually, there's a German-American bund. There are a bunch of people who are loyal to Hitler uh, and, and the fascists. Uh, and he goes, so, you know, we should probably expand, expand our surveillance capabilities. And he also says, and by the way, that there's probably some problem with American communists. Uh, so we should expand that way as well. And, uh, true, and Hoover yeah, or Roosevelt goes, yeah, all right, do that. Like, start looking. And so it opens up the possibility for Hoover to just start looking everywhere, right? And so we're talking about illegal wiretaps, illegal just human intelligence. Uh, illegal um, bugs and Hoover's, Hoover's just looking. And he's gathering information, gathering information. And then what he'll do is he'll, he'll, start, he'll start going to, his, to the enemies of FDR because FDR is looking for a way into World War II. And he's going uh, to FDR's enemies and he's, he's paying attention and he'll, he'll approach them and he'll say, hey, look, look at all this like sad dirt we found on you, we found on your spouse, we found on your kids. Uh, we found on your neighbors. It would sure be a shame if this stuff got out, right? Right. And it was like, and so either people were like, okay, well, I'm going to disappear now from the public scene because I don't want this stuff to get out, or people would push back and Hoover would like release it into the all, you know, all this media he has, and he would just like destroy people in, you know, just dest destroy their credibility. Uh, and then if, if it's like a, a federal judge and Hoover had tr problems with federal judges, like New Deal judges, uh, what he would do is, you know, step one, approach them with the dirt. I got dirt on you. Uh, step two is give them the chance to retire and just leave public life. And then if they did not leave public life, uh, you would, you know, shame them with all this, all the stuff, all the dirt. Uh, and then, and then you go to Congress and then you say, look at all the dirt there is on this judge. You got to impeach them because they are compromised. They are compromised. And so he would set up his own, you know, and so then they'd get impeached. Uh, and so, so he would just, he would just pick fights and he'd pit people against each other. Uh, and so he stop doing what they wanted to do. Like they would not, they would not stand down. The ones that would not bow to the dirt, he goes and says to Congress, look, these guys are compromised. The people who show they're not compromised. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so he, he, he recreates the federal government, uh, because he recreates the judiciary in the sense he picks the judges he wants. Uh, people like Nixon and Reagan uh, and Gerald Ford uh, and Joe McCarthy and Roy Cohn. Roy Cohn, by the way, I hope, you know, you might have, you might have heard of that guy because uh, then, you know, he's obviously connected to Donald Trump. Uh, these are, these are Hoover's foot soldiers and he teaches them this game and they rise with him. And so he creates this modern Republican party in the 1950s uh, with these types of politics. I mean, they're just gutter politics. So when Eisenhower gets in office, how does he, what's his relationship with Hoover? I think overall they had a good relationship, but he was not that, he, I, I don't think Eisenhower wanted dirt. Eisenhower, Eisenhower didn't need dirt because by the time Eisenhower's in office, right, the Red Scare is like hot. Uh, and Hoover, so what Hoover does is at this point, COINTELPRO gets launched around 1953. Uh, and so, and it's not, and I don't think Eisenhower knew anything about it. Uh, but Eisenhower had real interest in fighting the Soviet Union. And so Hoover was able to do a bunch of illegal operations uh, kind of under, under the nose, but without the knowledge of Eisenhower. Uh, and Eisenhower definitely ben benefited from those politics because I mean, his running mate is obviously Richard Nixon. Uh, and so they're both campaigning on, I'd, I'd argue different brands of anti-communism. I don't think Eisenhower was I don't think Eisenhower would want fascism, but I think Nixon was saw fascism as a route to power. And that's also true with like Roy Cohn. But also I, Eisenhower, uh, he, he, it took him a while to take on McCarthy. He, he was very tepid with McCarthy and he feared him to some extent. Yeah. And, and this, this, this kind of like illustrates how the, how the, how the battle lines were drawn because Hoover and McCarthy and Cohn would have been in a close network at that point. Uh, Eisenhower was worried that, Mac that McCarthy was taking the Republicans toward, you know, too much into the John Birch Society and that they would disgrace themselves and discredit themselves by saying stuff that they couldn't back up, which by the way is the history of, of, of the Palmer scare. 
Uh, a. Mitchell Palmer gets into trouble because he says, hey, everybody, I'm doing these, these Palmer raids because I found out that on May Day 2020, uh, there's going to be a huge communist revolution, and I'm just doing these, these roundups to keep you all safe. Uh, and, and, and it worked until May Day 2020 came and went and nothing happened. And then people were like, well, you're, that yeah, was much to do about nothing. <laughs> yeah, and that's World War I, right? So the Palmer raids are that come out of like the first Red Scare, which happens in World War I, which very quickly gets discredited. Yeah. Right. Which which actually is 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 a reason that people turn against the FBI momentarily. And that's kind of when Hoover shows up. So this is way earlier and you're seeing similar mm -hmm. trends. So then after yeah. after McCarthy is discredited, yep. what is the how does Hoover react to that? Hoover uh, distances himself from McCarthy. He cuts M McCarthy off. He tells FBI agents, uh, do not contact this guy. You know, we he is not welcome around here. Uh, and, you know, after that fall, I, I understand that McCarthy, like, he ends his, like, Senate career as kind of just like a just disheveled alcoholic uh, and, like, mumbling about, like, communist subversion and they're here, they're here, they're here. And, I mean, I, I presume McCarthy kind of got played by Hoover, as in Hoover, like, got into his head and said, you know, there's a huge problem. There's a huge problem. You know, the Soviet Union and nuclear spies and revolution and... McCarthy obviously saw opportunity for himself because he could campaign on this stuff, but I think he like took it as kind of this is happening, uh, and all I got to do is like talk and maybe bloviate and like get you know and and ride the tide. But I, I think he took it too far, and I don't think he had the skill. He didn't have the skill to talk in such a way that he could play poker and like pull back if he needed to. Like he got too much out, uh, yeah, and so he embarrasses like himself. I feel like this is reflected in the current political atmosphere with some of yeah. these characters, maybe in one from Wisconsin as well, the senator, current senator from Wisconsin. <laughs> it's strange. <laughs> okay, so then let's move into the civil rights era. We're trying to move up the timeline because we want to mm -hmm. get to today. And but 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 before we do, you know, I, I think it's relevant to talk about the civil rights era and Martin Luther King and, and the relationship between Hoover and King and even the Black Panthers. All right, so let's, uh, it's worthy to know that uh, the FBI understood that MLK's life was in jeopardy when he was assassinated and uh, Hoover ordered his agents to stand down. And so he, uh, he let the assassination happen. Uh, and before that moment, and I can say, we can say the same thing about uh, JFK. Uh, they understood that JFK was in jeopardy and he ordered FBI agents to pull out. Uh, and so, so we got a pattern there between those two assassinations and that JFK thing became uh, public when Trump ordered the National Archives to uh, release the JFK assassination information. Uh, and so we found out that Hoover was not surprised by the assassination. Uh, but with, so with this tactic and with MLK, um, Hoover from the, from the, okay, actually, so let's, I, I'll do this quick. So I just want you to know, uh, and, th and this has to, and because this, this is all a pattern and the, the, the pattern starts this way. So Hoover in the 1930s, and I promise I won't take a long time on this. Hoover in the 1930s, uh, he liked the politics of the New Deal because it was expanding the FBI. And with that, it was expanding right, the, the presidency. And so these things expanded together. But he did not like the politics in that, the, pipe, the types of people that were being elevated. He did not like the, that the New Deal helped uh, organize labor and poor people. He did not like that uh, the New Deal had links and ties to the civil rights movement. And these things get connected in about 1935 because the National Labor Relations Act gets passed and then unioners go to the South and start organizing sharecroppers. And so therefore there's this link between the organized, organized labor and civil rights movements that happens in the mid 1930s. And Hoover doesn't like none of that. Uh, you then, so through the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, you get the rise of uh, these larger civil rights movements. And we also see moments, we see integration on military bases. We see Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and these new, and, and so and I look at this as kind of like a the reverberations of that New Deal moment where where laborers and black people got to work together to begin to change social life. So Hoover connects MLK to this history. That this is just one more example of um, and the Black Panthers to this history of that bad New Deal politic that came in 
that Hoover's going to call Marxist because he's going to call the New Deal Marxist. And so it's not surprising that Hoover uh, calls MLK a communist because that's just like his bag of tricks. And uh, I think there is a link between somebody who is communist and MLK, but to like say, oh, this guy is like this big like Soviet spy, right? Makes no sense. And, and, and that was the suggestion that, it, that MLK was doing what he was doing to help, uh, to help the Soviet Union. And so Cold War politics kind of allowed Hoover to demonize Martin Luther King. But then there's like this funny like reversal and it's just like, like issues of power and order. But then, and because of this, MLK is able to go to um, the United Nations and give a speech and say, hey, y'all talk about America as being a place of democracy and freedom, but look at it. We have our own fascist police department. Uh, and it just, it, that really ticks, ticks off J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, and, and, but be, but it, it was a just beautiful move, right? And I think this, this, this helps precipitate um, LBJ uh, in the in, in the movement with between uh, the voting rights and the civil rights acts that happened in the mid 1960s, uh, but obviously a lot of blood. Right? I mean, MLK has to die with those marchers. You know, a lot of people get beat and um, and killed, and the, the bus rider, uh, bus riders as well. Um, but Hoover looks at all of this as subversion, as Soviet subversion. And does he believe it, or is it convenient? I don't know. Um, I, I think he probably convinced himself, but I mean, cause he's, he's older at this point, but uh, it, it was convenient to call it subversion. I mean, that's the interesting thing about the relationship with MLK, right? Because I mean, the FBI tries to get him to kill himself, right? I mean, they put together this dirt pile, like this old school thing they do, send it to him. And they're like, in the letter, they're basically like, you know what to do about this, you filthy, filthy human being. And so that's all going on there. And so you have this relationship where it's a clear, there's a clear threat there. And what's interesting is, I mean, you've seen so far, we've seen that Hoover's instrumental in legitimizing the New Deal. Hoover is then uh, instrumental in legitimizing this Red Scare 1950s era. It seems like at this point, like you're talking about, there's this, there's this pressure, the international pressure that also has, you know, huge implications for the civil rights movement, right? The propaganda is bad. It's bad optics when you're trying to get the rest of the world on your side to also have like your version of the KGB if it's cast that way. So you have this whole period where there you have COINTELPRO, which is this like complete, you know, subversion of people's civil liberties, right? Phone tappings, illegal, you know, people getting planted in, uh, you know, in meetings. So you then get through this and you get to Nixon. And this is what's interesting to me is uh, we actually had a phone call. Like we talked for like 10 minutes on the phone whenever, whenever I got Steve on the, on the podcast. And he was like blowing my mind. And I was like, we got to stop. I got to save all this for the show because all I wanted to do was keep on listening to you. Um, but you, you've laid out where there's it's formed in the 50s, this relationship between the Republican Party. And you even mentioned Nixon. What's fascinating to me is that like you can see that trajectory moving forward. But there's a moment when Nixon is president where the FBI is actually investigating him. And, you know, there's that famous moment where he calls in the CIA to shut down an FBI investigation. So like what goes awry there? Like why is, why by this point do you have Nixon who obviously is part of this fifties moment? Why do you have the FBI suddenly investigating him? Nixon uh, does not like the idea of having an FBI director uh, who's more powerful than himself. Nixon uh, wants to use the FBI as his own political apparatus. Nixon wants to use the FBI the way that Trump wanted to use the FBI, okay? And Hoover did not want any president using the FBI like that because if the FBI was politicized and, and it came out, <laughs> right? I mean, right. the FBI is always politicized, always but and it came out, then you'd have another teapot dome moment that would force a moment of reform and scrutiny, which would break apart the FBI. Because I mean, Hoover went through the teapot dome. Uh, and, and, and it's that type of thing uh, that gets followed by, that, that turns into scandal. And then the scandal turns into uh, reform and accountability and people losing their jobs. Okay. So he goes to war with them and, and that kind of sorts that out. Bob, you had a question. Well, no, I was going to say that's exactly what happens after Watergate, right? The whole intelligence apparatus of the United States goes through an, you know, an incredible uh, period of, of retraction, right? There's all these, all this oversight is placed on the FBI and the CIA at this point. That's the church committee. Mm -hmm. Right. right. In the mid seventies. So you, mm -hmm. you come out of this and now you've got this, this reformed like this, you know, as uh, you know, it's been called the post-imperial presidency. 
right? Where you have this whole scrutiny on the, on the executive office and then Reagan comes into power, right? How does Reagan's relationship with the FBI, how does that change? Okay. Uh, so first I'd like to, I'm going to back up about, I guess maybe two years to 1978. So that guy, so you mentioned that uh, MLK gets this letter saying you're dirt, you're trash, you're scum. Um, the guy who wrote that letter, uh, his name was, uh, his last name Sullivan. He was a high ranking FBI official. Uh, Hoover dies and he wanted to become the FBI director after Hoover dies. Uh, but that does not happen. Hoover dies. Uh, Sullivan quits actually right before Hoover dies. Uh, Mark Felt, who goes on to become Deep Throat, becomes the acting uh, FBI director. Uh, Sullivan writes a book that's kind of like a tell-all, like because he hates Hoover at this point. Uh, now, you know, I, you know, he, a lot, lot, lot of bitterness. And the, you have these church investigations, uh, sorry, the church committee. Uh, and then Sullivan's inv invited to testify, and he's going to testify, and he's going to give Congress like a lot of dirt. And this is like late 19, maybe 1978. Uh, and then he goes uh, to his front porch. Uh, to get his newspaper, and he's shot dead by uh, a guy, by a hunter who mistook him for a deer, and that hunter happened to be the local sheriff's son, and uh, the hunter was found not at fault the day of. So, so I feel as though that was formative of like where we're at going into Reagan. <laughs> like this the, is insane. Yeah, yeah. That moment is, is just weird to me. And, it, and I feel as though it's just not talked. There's so much of this that isn't, isn't talked about because I feel as though it sounds crazy to talk about. So it's like, and it's like kind of impolite to talk about, but it is, it's like we have a political system that we call democracy where people go and they vote and there's like, you know, the general election, there's the midterm election and you hear the speeches, but then there's another political system all around it. One that we don't talk about that like kind of makes bigger macro level decisions about what you get to vote for. And that, this uh, is what some would call the deep state. Mm -hmm. Right. And the argument yeah. in the country right now is, are they bad or good? Mm -hmm. And you will answer that question depending on who you are and what they're battling. Um, so, so it's interesting because, and I don't want to, I want to follow the, the historical thread, but, you know, when I thought about this episode, like, this is what made me say, Ben, we need, need to do a FBI episode because I'm obviously following the the goings on at Mar Mar a Lago, and I'm, you know, I'm like FBI good, FBI good guy, good guys, and you know that's what we're we're at, right. Like, like my my personal opinion that I've expressed many times is the former president is a criminal many times over, and it's you know I don't know if I'll live to see him be charged with anything or get get his just desserts in my mind but but you know he gets caught with these documents i think it's pretty cut and dry there national archives and um then he attacks the fbi literally attacks the fbi mm -hmm. and i was like man you know when i was young i was suspicious of, of authority but now you know now i trust the authority I trust the authority to do what's right, to do the right thing. I trust they're doing the right thing. But we have at least 30, maybe close to 50% of the country mistrusts the authority of the government and the apparatus of the government, which the FBI is part of. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute, J. Edgar Hoover. Well, of course people wouldn't trust the FBI. Why would you trust the FBI? So I ask you, why would you trust the FBI? I will answer the question this way. Um, <laughs> part of the agreement between Hoover and the Republicans in the 1950s was um, the FBI would become a Republican Party apparatus. And at that point, it already was. Hoover was given, and beginning of the 1920s, Hoover was given kind of like a, like a, like a carve-out deal that other agencies did not get. And it was like, he didn't have to go through the Civil Service Commission. He, he could hire whoever he wanted, and he could fire whoever he wanted. 
And so he packed his agency with conservatives and what that means is with Republicans. And so, and that continues today. And so if you wonder, well, that's unusual. Why would Barack Obama appoint a Republican to be his FBI director with James Comey? There was only a few people he could appoint and they were all Republican. You know, or why would Joe Biden choose to keep Christopher Ray on as FBI? Well, it's not like there's a Democrat that, there, that is available. Like all FBI directors have to be Republicans because only Republicans are eligible for the job because of how that agency has been stacked with Republicans, okay? And so to get to your question, why would I trust the FBI? Um, right now we are witnessing a strange battle between MAGA Republicans and what Trump calls rhinos. And if you take the time in your mind to think about who are these two groups of people, you can put together that we are watching like a, a party implode and kill itself. Why would I trust the FBI right now? Now, if, if, if the FBI only ran criminal investigations, which means like, uh, right, so I, Judge Eileen Cannon, right? So she's saying he gets a special master and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And like the whole system has to be one of pr procedure. And, um, you know, everything has to like pass the sniff test based on like what a judge says or a judge picked by Trump, right? I would be like, oh man, we're kind of hosed. We're kind of hosed because like, it seems like it sure is like boxed in right now. Like everything is against the FBI. Uh, but then if you remember, oh, wait, but the FBI also runs counter espionage operations. It's a very different playbook. It's, it's a different toolbox. If you're running a counter espionage operation, uh, you're not worried about what a judge will say because a judge will never see what you did. You will not worry about what a defense attorney will say because that defense attorney will never see what you did. Uh, you are not, you're not really thinking in terms of like a conviction. You're thinking of neutralization. So if your question is, why would I trust the FBI right now to handle this moment right now? Uh, the rhino Republicans, uh, and, and, and I don't mean to be a jerk, I'm just trying to like make this clear. The rhino Republicans, uh, they're getting doxxed. If you're an FBI agent, right, and you're having your personal information put online so white supremacists can go and hurt you and your family, it's gonna make you mad. Uh, you're, you're probably very suspicious, or you're, you're probably worried about how cagey Vladimir Putin's getting, feeling all boxed in and losing wars. Is there a moment where he, Vladimir Putin decides to just like go nuclear because like he's losing, right? I mean, I, I presume there's military planners who will like have that conversation and that's gotta be kind of, kind of terrifying. Uh, you're also, if you're an FBI agent, you're thinking, wow, Trump always had very nice things to say about Vladimir Putin. And man, Trump sure went out of his way to get nuclear secrets to Mar-a-Lago. And oh man, Trump did, it was so weird that Trump, uh, right? Trump, Trump deliberately hired a bunch of international workers from like Europe to come work at Mar-a-Lago. And then you also have that situation. There's that, her name is like, they, they don't know who she is now. Her name is Inna, is, is her first name, but she's the Russian born Ukrainian spy. I say spy, but they don't know. Like she could just, she could only be connected to organized crime. But anyhow, she totally was at Mar-a-Lago uh, posing to be um, a banker at uh, like, fake identity, and they understand that she was there for a while. And we also understand that you had all these secrets about. Um, if you're an FBI agent, you're not worried about Judge Eileen Cannon and her saying you get a special master. You're probably thinking more in terms of how do we stop this? How do we do containment? Like how do we do old school anti-communist containment? And when that's the question, um, you have a lot of resources. Uh, but you have, but but you have to do things that don't get you caught. And this is what J. Edgar Hoover was best at: is like doing stuff and not getting caught. And so Hoover was able to use this power to, you know, stay in power for fifty years. Uh, and he did nasty stuff that like stopped him from getting caught. And so I presume if you're Christopher Ray right now, you're questioning, okay, what can you do to stop the threat? Because this is kind of a crisis moment, but also not get the FBI caught. And I, and, and, and I don't know why, maybe this is my own psyche, but I take some comfort in that, that I trust that Christopher Ray has resources because it seems like the power of the FBI is pretty enormous. Yeah, and one of the things I think was really interesting that I was listening to, uh, I love this podcast, it's called, if it was called What Can Trump Teach Us About Con Law, now it's called What Can Rome and Mars Teach Us About, uh, Learn About the Con Law. But one of the things they brought up on that, on the, in the episode was, the implications of Trump's claim 
the implications of Trump's claim that he declassified those documents in his defense. Which, if, by the way, he made today clearly on the U. Hewitt program. And this this is going to air on Monday. This is Thursday morning. He he went really far on that, saying that he de he declassified everything. Well, if you have this across the board ability to declassify anything without any, you know, without well, by just saying later on you did it, it opens up a can of worms in which one could, if one has that authority, apparently then that could be read to say the president also has the, the authority to disclose people who are working under, undercover, to disclose the identities and personal information of people who have spent their lives like doing these clandestine operations. And now the way you, we're talking about this, it seems to me like that's another immediate threat the FBI sees because they have people who have been, you know, embedded in these places. And that could be a real threat to those individuals. Yeah. And what a J. Edgar Hoover move, isn't it? To be like, it'd be a shame if something bad happened. Right. I mean, that is when I think of that, um, that J. Edgar Hoover mentored Roy Cohn and Roy, and, and this is from like 1950 to 1972. And then J. Edgar Hoover dies. And the very next year, Roy Cohn goes to Donald Trump. And then he mentors Roy, Donald Trump uh, till the mid-1980s when Roy Cohn dies. And in 1979, Cohn introduces Trump and Roger Stone together. And that's like how that, tree, you know, that trinity happens. Um, it's the same tactics, right? It's that same blackmail, just raw power, power tool tactics. And now the FBI is seeing Essentially, it's legacy come back around to haunt it. And we should remember that uh, between Hoover's death in 72 and today, the Democrats tried to take J. Edgar Hoover's name off the building 20 times, and the Republicans defeated it each and every time. I mean, talk about symbolic gesture. It's funny, we, we, it's like we're coming back to the beginning, which is a great place, you know, as we approach the end of the interview is that it was about the bad guys, right? Getting the bad guys and the bad guys look, look so good. Hollywood makes the bad guys look good. And, and, and it's like, they became Hoover. He became the bad guy and, and drunk with power, drunk with, you know, you know, having all that power at his disposal, ultimately it corrupts you, right? Yeah. I, going back to this, this idea of like, uh, of is it, is the FBI good or bad? I mean, I think like the heart of that question, which I know like you're posing this like question where you like, you know, flip back and forth. I don't know. It, to me, it's like the whole idea is that, um, is that, is that it, you can't, you just in your mind, you can't make it either one. Mm -hmm. Like you got to keep the a balance of power requires that like no one look at it as black and white. So it's like, if you think it's all good, then of course they're going to go nuts. Right. If you think it's all bad, they're operating under stressful conditions where they can't do the things we actually need them to do. So it's like a case by case basis. And in this case, I mean, it is insane to me to think, and it's like the evidence that's out there right now, like just, just, just strip whatever you think politically. It's like, he took documents that he wasn't supposed to take. They then asked him to return them. And he, and he, he said he, he did, right. He was like, yeah, but when they came in to search for the first time for those documents, they wouldn't let him go in certain rooms. And it turns out those are the rooms where the documents were. And then on these talk shows, people are like, he's like, he's like, you know, they're secured at my house. But then people defending out there are like, when he, when his, I mean, what a, what a sad defense when he goes, I can't believe the FBI took this picture of these documents on the floor. That's not where they were. I would never leave them on the floor like that. And that they try that talking point, which is sad. And then he's got people on cable news networks being like, yeah, that's not how his office is. I go in that office all the time. And I've seen that office. It's not like that. And you go. So you and a bunch of people were in and out of an office where these documents were being held. That doesn't help your case. And it just seems like he's grasping. And I don't know. It just seems to me like if you're listening and you're like, you, you know, you're, you're someone who supports Donald Trump. Okay. Like take it back to that principle. I was just saying earlier, maybe don't just say someone's good or bad. Maybe look at each individual case and ask yourself if this was anyone else, would would they would would they have a justification or would you even believe them? I mean, this is like this is like a child going back, going back, going back, going back. Yeah, but I didn't do that. Like I asked Solomon the other day, hey, do you get gum on your shirt today? And he's like, no. Nope. And I'm like, well, Kelly said you got gum on your shirt. He's like, no, no, I didn't. And then my dad comes out and I go, hey, did he get gum on his shirt yesterday? And my dad goes, no, that was yesterday. <laughs> and I look at him and I'm like, you're already playing the technicality card, dude. It's just like at some point you got to hold somebody accountable. Um, 
Steve, I got one more question for you before we go. Um, you know, we wanted to do this episode and, and I, I went, I, I told Bob, I said, I'm going to find somebody who's good for this. And I went through and I found your work and you have this new book out. It came out in 2020, the manufacture of consent, J. Edgar Hoover and the rhetorical rise of the FBI. It hits from the very beginning. You open with this contrast between, you know, the, the, the Truman doctrine speech and at the same time, J. Edgar Hoover's speech in Congress and, and uh, to HUAC. And it's, it's, it's great from the beginning. Uh, but my question for you is this, how does this look different to you as someone who doesn't study, who is not, not in the field of history, but you study communications, you study rhetoric. That to me was the most interesting thing about you and why I said, Bob, we got to get this guy on. So like, how, how do you think like your discipline allows you to see things differently than like someone who's working as an academic historian specifically? Uh, it's the, the look at speech itself, the look at narrative, the look at metaphor, uh, and then how this language gets amplified and circulated through mass media. Because when you study it that way, you're actually studying human consciousness. And when you're studying consciousness and what people are thinking, uh, you can see how ideology begins to transform. And when, you're, and, and when you get at that stage, you, you then see how ideology repeats itself. And I feel like we're just in this carousel and we are back at a point that we've been at before. And um, you know, so they say deep state now, they had a metaphor in the forties called the, the fifth column, same idea. Um, and so you, you can track these, just how people talk to understand what's going on in a particular culture, you know, in a particular era. Uh, and it's made, it, it's made, it makes the news interesting because like I can like, I can open the news and I'll be like, oh, this is like links to that and this links to that. Uh, but it also kind of, it's kind of isolating because you find yourself recognizing that, oh, this Trump guy, he's probably very dangerous. <laughs> hey, everybody, I want to talk to you about like five years ago, how dangerous I think this guy might be. And then, oh, no, you just have to let it play out. You don't know. And I'm like, no, but if you talk in this way, it means you're planning to do something pretty bad. Mark my words, oh, wow. uh, you know, and so you kind of like feel like you're living kind of like ahead of like where the, the news cycle gets at. So it's um, it's interesting, but stressful. Uh, nothing new under the sun, eh? <laughs> yeah. Well, Stephen Underhill, thank you so much. This has been great. Uh, ben, Ben found us a good expert for this topic, and we're glad it's you. Well, thank you so much. It's really my pleasure to be here and have these conversations. Yeah. We'll we'll before do you... it again as it continues to play out. I would yes. love that. And Steve, before you go, could you just tell people where to find you? Where can they follow you? Where they can keep up with uh, with your commentary? Sure. Well, I work. I'm, I'm the professor and chair of communication studies at Marshall University, and you'll find my work uh, in the various communication studies uh, databases and articles. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you, sir. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you so thank you. much.